Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining Simania Clinic tonight for such an interesting talk. We're going to look at overcoming challenges, particularly in disability sport, and looking at ways to excel therein. So our key speaker for tonight is Dr. Jeanette. She holds both a PhD as well as an MBA. She has over 20 years experience in the pharmaceutical industry. She's worked in areas around vaccines, infectious diseases, competitive as well as business intelligence. She's got a portfolio in terms of her competitor insights. Her current and extra professional focus is that she's a manager for the East London Lynx SVB club and she plays a volunteer role therein. Her background, she has a BSc in biochemistry a PhD in biochemistry, as well as infectious diseases and vaccines. She holds an executive MBA from the Imperial College London, and she also has an honorary PhD in business. Thank you so much, Jeanette, for providing us with your insights tonight. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Over to you. Well, thank you, Kim, for the introduction and for inviting me to speak today. Uh, when you asked me some weeks ago to speak, I, I thought about my various experiences in sport and in light of the current context we're living to reflect upon the importance of sport, especially disability sport. So the title of my presentation is Overcoming Challenges, Excelling in Disability Sport. So I became uh, you know, disabled some years ago, I'm a quadruple amputee, but I was keen to be, you know, still active and involved in sport. So my journey to regaining my fitness can be divided into two groups. The first is life on the inside, that is the in-hospital rehabilitation. After I came out of a coma, I was only able to use, uh, I was only able to use my eyes, to open my eyes. And so I had to have various physiotherapy to gain movement and the stronger I got and the more able I was able to move, I then was able to do stretches and various exercises, in particular, working on core stability. During my time in hospital, I was then reintroduced to sport. And in that case, it was swimming. And so then life outside uh, the hospital, and that's the second part of my regaining fitness. And this is where I'll concentrate, you know, part of my uh, talk on, okay? So as I said, I was keen to get back my fitness, regain and you know, start using a, a gym. So when I left hospital after a year in various um, hospitals, I had to attend various appointments. And during these appointments, I would then attend the rehab gym that was at the new hospital. And this was a, a newly built hospital. And I would go on the treadmill for about 10 minutes but this was not sufficient. Then the hospital transferred me as an outpatient to a local hospital where I was able to get uh, local uh, physiotherapy. And this was twice a week. And during these experiences, I was started to use the treadmill with the support of a physiotherapist. But as I said, I was keen to get back into the gym and therefore I was referred to a local community gym using the exercise referral scheme. So this is a scheme which is a specific formalized program that we have in the UK, whereby a medical profession refers a client, a patient to a fitness program. And it's a 12 week program. And the, the goal of this program is to seek to increase somebody's, somebody's physical activity on the basis that being physically active has a range of positive benefits. So on completion of my program, I thought I'd be able to use a local gym. However, they're not able to cater for me. So I thought, what am I going to do? I need to find a solution. And so I stopped using the gym for a while. I then tried to find a solution and I looked to find a local gym near me, a small gym in a hotel behind my house. So I approached them and I was able to have one-to-one -one basic exercise classes with a gym instructor. However, the gym instructor then left. But what was good was the hotel then introduced what they call personal trainers. And so I progressed at that stage to being able to use the gym equipment and to be able to train with a personal trainer on a regular basis. So this happened for several years. 
However, it got to a point where I thought I've reached my, my peak. I need to, you know, move forward. And I changed gyms. I then moved to the University of East London. They have a gym there called the Sports Dock. And I started to train. And at this point, I trained with a trainer that specialized in function and rehabilitation fitness. And at the Sports Dock gym, they have a, you know, a wide selection of equipment that I was able to use in a wheelchair. And then I started to use various adaptations such as a prosthetic hand and various straps in order to use the equipment. And you know, that was very good for me and that carried on for several years. However, I wanted to do other activities and several years prior, I had been living in Tuscany and I had started to take theory lessons in order to obtain my uh, skipper's sailing license. And as I lived near the docks, I thought, you know, why not revisit sailing? And so I approached the Royal Docks Club and they did offer disabled sailing as do many clubs in the UK and around the world. And in fact, they have adapted a boat and equipment to allow people to sail. So I began to sail and the Royal Yachts Association have a program that support and encourage people with disabilities to enable them to take up sailing. So I did that and I actually in 2014 obtained my level one certificate. So I was sailing, I was sailing once a week. However, as winter approached, I thought, let me start you know, looking for something to do, some activities to do close to my house. And that's when I discovered the sport sitting volleyball or para volley. And this is a form of volleyball for athletes with disability. And it has been part of the Paralympic games since 1980. And as you can see here, it is played on the floor and it consists of two teams playing on court with six players on each side. I have to tell you all that sitting volleyball is very inclusive. As you can see here, you know, it is inclusive for, you know, players and open to everybody up to the national level. We have, this is uh, some pictures taken from a fundraising event that we played and we have players of all ages. You're able to play in mixed teams, different uh, physical abilities, different technical abilities as well, and all ages. One of the rules is the players have to keep a portion of their torso in contact with the ground at all times. So playing uh, sitting volleyball is easy to join and doesn't require individual equipment to play, such as in the case of wheelchair uh, basketball or wheelchair rugby, where you have to have specialized uh, wheelchair. So I then joined the East London uh, Lynx uh, sitting volleyball team in 2010. At the beginning, I was training occasionally because at that point I was completing my MBA. And once I completed my MBA, I then started to train on a regular basis. I then improved and moved to uh, play at a national level. And on this uh, point, I was on loan to another team called the Essex Pirates. Once I got better, I moved to play at international level for East London Lynx as part of the development team. And I was fortunate to participate in tournaments in Hamburg and Copenhagen. And I was captain of the East London Lynx development team. And as I progressed, I became, you know, obviously you know, better at playing. And I began to play for the GB women's team. However, playing sitting volleyball had many challenges and obstacles. And one of them was, you know, how do I get to the venue? I use an uh, electric wheelchair and it was a challenge to get there because I had to look for transport. I had to look for a taxi. How do I get a taxi? Will the taxi be able to take me? Sometimes they're not reliable. But I overcome that solution by having to get an adaptable vehicle and, you know, being able to drive myself. Another challenge, as you can see in the picture below here, is that because I'm an um, amputee, I have challenges in blocking. If you've played volleyball, you know it is an advantage having hands. Well, in this case for me, I'm limited. However, what did we do? Well, we thought let's leverage a collaboration we have with the East London University and their product design team. So we got together with the students. As part of their course, they had to develop some sports adaptation uh, equipment. And in this case, as shown here, the students looked at upper limb adaptations for me. And so these are some prototypes that they developed. And I was fortunate enough to try in situ some of the final products. However, for various reasons, I was not able to use the um, adaptations to play volleyball. I have always been interested or you know, participated in various activities. And when I became aware of the Calvert Trust, which is a challenging outdoor adventure holiday, I thought, why not? Let me go and try it. So I went on a short holiday. And during this experience, I tried various activities such as climbing, zipline jumping, archery, horse riding. 
And the Cutlass Trust is set in the Lake District, which is known for you know, its various lakes. And they had various uh, water activities for us to try. And so we went out canoeing. And this raised my uh, curiosity. You know, I thought, could I be able to kayak and canoe? So after a few tries on ground, trying to see if I could be able to paddle, I thought, yeah, let me go for it. So I took the plunge, went in the water, and I was able to canoe independently. And I thought, okay, you know, why don't I combine my, my newfound interest of you know, water sport with an interest of fundraising? Because one thing I like to do is I like to volunteer and do various fundraising activities. So I looked around and I found a fundraising event that involved whitewater rafting. So I thought, can I do it? Let me investigate. So I went to my local uh, whitewater rafting center and while they did not allow me to try it, I was able to see if I would be able to hold an oar. So with my adaptations, went out, tried it, and I was able to hold the oar. So I went back to my sailing club. At that point, I was sailing at Fairlock Waters and spoke to the instructor, and he took me out canoeing. So we went out canoeing, and I you know, confirmed that I was able to do it. I then spoke to the access instructor at Fairlock Waters uh, Sailing Club about me being able to raft and he said to me that he didn't see a problem. So I go back to my personal trainer at University of East London. I say, look, I would like to do this thing. Let's get on it. So we started to use various adaptations, fill up water, let me the canoe o, and I began to train. So I got into this training regime and I was doing various activities in the gym with my instructor to be able to simulate the ability to train because I wanted to go out there and be able to fully participate in this uh, rafting experience okay so I did it got to a good level of fitness and off I was on a plane all the way to Zambia so got there ready for my adventure and in preparation for my trip I had spent a lot of focus working on the water aspect how was I going to manage when I got there I was faced with you know the adventure of trying to find solutions to various problems and various obstacles encountered, given that it was a five-day camping and rafting trip down the river Zambezi. So the first challenge was how do I get from the vehicle down to the riverbed, okay? I mean, this entailed a downward walk through, you know, the wilderness and various rocky terrain. How'd you do it? So as you can see here, I had to be carried. So I was carried on a rescue board downhill. We got there. Started our adventure, five day adventure, rafting down a grade five river. And as you can see, the facilities are, you know, very basic camping for somebody that's a quadruple amputee, big challenge. But I was lucky. I was lucky in that, as you can see in the bottom picture, I had a bit of luxury. I had an ensuite. So here is my bedroom facility. And there I had my little ensuite toilet. Yeah, so that was good for me. And there I had, you know, a wonderful experience and I was able to participate in the rafting here in the raft with my other uh, teammates and down we went down and had a, you know, a wonderful time. And in this occasion, I managed to raise nearly 15,000 pounds for my charity of interest, okay? So over the years, while I've tried various activities, I have still continued to play sitting volleyball and still continue to be active in the gym. And now I'm currently using my local community gym but before I was able to use my local community gym, I obviously had some issues. So I approached them, did a exercise referral scheme as I'd previously done, but as I had experienced previously, they were not able to, to take me on. So what I did is I continued to use the gym at East London, then went back two years later with a second referral scheme, had discussions with the management, and they were very supportive. They had changed management at this, port, at this point, they're very supportive and I, was, you know, I train with them now twice a week. I'm able to use various equipment and I've taken up boxing. And this has really enabled me to up my game and improve my fitness levels. And in that, I continue to play for links at both at national level and international level. And now I've, you know, for several years now, I'm the manager of the East London Lynx sitting volleyball team and I support the coach who's actually also the coach of GB. And as a manager, you know, they're various, you know, Challenges that we have in particular, recruitment and retention. Sitting volleyball is not a well-known sport. You know, it's not like athletics or wheelchair basketball or wheelchair uh, rugby. 
So we're competing for a, you know, a small pool of athletes because obviously being a para sport, you have to, if you want to compete at a national level, it has to be you know, disabled athletes. So we're competing against you know, top sports. Another problem we have is funding. After London 2012, funding has been very limited and often players have to part, uh, pay for their trips you know, to international games. And therefore you have the problem of it becoming a very expensive hobby. However, recently in the last few weeks, we've been very fortunate to get funding from UK Sport and therefore we have secured our future for the next you know, few years. So in addition to playing for Lynx, I've continued to play for the GB women. I train regularly and had my first cap for GB against uh, Canada in 2016. As a team, we participate in local tournaments as well as the National Grand Prix, which is a club tournament. And when required, we also you know, play and train against the GB Invictus team when they are preparing for Invictus Games. I'm sure you've all heard of the Invictus Games. In addition to that, obviously we play at international tournaments. So now I just wanna briefly talk about my sitting volleyball experience playing for South Africa. I have family in South Africa and often visit South Africa. And during my visit to Cape Town, I train, you know, about the, you know, the opportunity to train with the Icapa Storm team. And the picture on the left is with me and Anton Raimondo. Anton played for GB at the 2012 Olympics in London and also for East London Link sitting volleyball. And he is the founder and president of Para Volley South Africa. And during my visit in 2019, I played at the South African National Club Championships for sitting volleyballs in Stellenbosch. And so that's a, a picture me there with my teammates from ICAPA Storm. And so 2019 was a very good year for me. So after I played at the South African sitting volleyball championships, I then represented Great Britain at the European Championships in Budapest, Hungary. At this point, I then decided to revisit the user adaptations to play sitting volleyball because many of the players that played at the championships had upper limb uh, deficiencies and they were playing successfully with the uh, prosthetic arms. So I went to my prosthetist, talked to her and she fitted me with a new prosthetic arm in uh, the beginning of 2020 last year. However, before I got a chance to use it, we then had lockdown and there was no physical training. So what happened then last April while I was having drinks with some friends in Italy, this was virtual drinks, their son did not join us. And when I asked about him, it turns out that he was actually participating in virtual football training. So I had some consultations with Gabriele and he told me all about his training. And so I approached the coach of sitting volleyball with the idea of having sitting volleyball, virtual sitting volleyball training in the evenings. So we've had this and this has been very, very successful in keeping some level of fitness, training, some level of, you know, level of engagement and team spirit in these particular times. During the lockdown, it has been important for us to be able to keep fit physically, very important for mental well-being, especially with uh, players being in isolation for long periods of time. Many of the players live on their own, so it's important for them to have some contact. So we have uh, blocks of uh, sessions of around 12 weeks, also to uh, avoid Zoom fatigue. And in these sessions, we have had, I've had you know, players join, you know, a variety of players, different ability, gender, ages, you know, physical abilities as well. We have able body physical um, impairment as well. And from different geographical locations, I have players join from across the UK. Anton has joined from South Africa. And we have Gemma who's 16 years old, joined from Kenya. She was in remote school learning and therefore not able to have school sports and therefore participated in our virtual training. When we're, when we're not been having virtual training, I've had various virtual team drinks and pub quizzes in order to continue to you know, keep that social contact among the players. And we have started our third virtual training block on the 31st of March as we prepare to return to play. So virtual training has provided, you know, training for people. It's been very successful, especially in retaining uh, players. However, this option has not been possible for everybody. As I've highlighted, Anton was able to join from South Africa, but his players were not. And this was because of a lack of resources, in particular computers and phone, access to Wi-Fi, having money to be able to pay and have reliable Wi-Fi. 
I did look at the possibility of seeing if we could get computers for them provided. However, given the short period of lockdown time, it was not feasible. And still this would not overcome the issue of them having reliable Wi-Fi. Okay, so now I just wanna move on and touch a bit more about sitting volleyball in South Africa because the benefits of physical sports and you know, sitting volleyball in particular is enormous. And Para Volleyball South Africa was founded by Anton in 2014 and has around 11 sitting volleyball teams across Western Cape, Limpopo and KwaZulu-Natal. And South Africa participated in the Africa City Volleyball Championships in 2017 and 2019, coming fifth, which is an amazing achievement given the short uh, time it has taken to set up the, the, um, the club. So in South Africa, sitting volleyball is providing people from disadvantaged communities with an outlet. In many places across the world, in many communities, having disability carries a stigma. And City Volleyball provides people with a focus. It provides people with a sense of belonging and community. It gives them a common goal. It gives them something to work forward to, something to be part of, and you know, to join in and have some social engagement and to work together with people you know, to achieve something. Unfortunately, the impact of COVID on sitting volleyball is there, you know? And you know, now we're returning back, we're looking to return back to, to playing. And in South Africa, they're starting to, you know, to, to play. And while the players are ready to return, we, they have three major tournaments starting in the, in the second half of the year. They're, you know, the various stakeholders need some time to organize. Therefore, it will take a while for them to really get back to that pre-COVID sitting volleyball momentum. You know? And unfortunately, at the moment, we don't know the full impact of COVID-19 on sitting volleyball. In the UK, we hope to start back full training uh, in May and be able to go to the European Championships in October. We have yet to see if it's all, you know, uncertain. And so I, now I just wanna share a short clip from a documentary that was prepared uh, for Paraboli South Africa, just to give the South African uh, audience a different insight into the impact of sitting volleyball on my South African teammates. Okay, so I'll share this video. So that was just a, a video just to um, 
to, to you know, give a different insight. Unfortunately, I was not able to increase the volume. I'm just seeing your message. It was at maximum. For some reason, it's not so high. But there is a link here I can share if anybody would like to go and, uh, and look at the full uh, short documentary. It's about six minutes. And I think it's you know, very interesting to also, you know, to see and understand the impact and, and the challenges of uh, disability sport. You know? So that concludes my presentation. And I hope I've given you, you know, some key learnings in terms of overcoming challenges and obstacles and excelling in, in what you choose to do, excelling in your goals, it's excelling in you know, whatever you want to do and, and achieve. And for those of you in South Africa, if you want to know a bit more about sitting volleyball, I have put a link here for the Paravolley South Africa and there's an email here. And I want to thank you all for your time and, you know, and attention and uh, open the floor for any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Jeanette. Any questions from you, Dr. Tony? Not questions as such, but uh, uh, comments in terms of, uh, I always talk about the fact that it, it can be done. And um, I, I read extensively uh, books of people that have achieved their dreams uh, in spite of all odds. And, and this is just a typical uh, example of such. I, I'm hoping that uh, Jeanette can, can, can write a book because she's got an amazing story. And, uh, Rachel actually always says that to me. Rachel always says to me, I need to write a book. You need to write a book. You, it, it doesn't have to be about this only. It, it can trace a, a lot of things. I, I, I'm writing one in my mind, it's still in process. It's titled Foreign Native, the A to Z of my stay in South Africa. So these are the things that I'm, I'm thinking about. Uh, people must read about you, your struggles, your encounters, your challenges, your happy moments, your influence, your leadership, everything. People want to read stories, you know? Even if it's self-publishing, this, this needs to be put down uh, in paper. Thank you. Congratulations, and I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for your feedback. Thank you so much. I'm glad you've enjoyed it. Yes. Um, it was a, you know, a short helicopter view, you know. Um, yes. So. Thanks so much, Dr. Tony. Dr. Libeko, any remarks or questions from yourself? Nothing really from my side, uh, but just um, just to add on to what uh, Dr. Tony has just said, I think we'll anticipate that book um, very soon. And um, it really is an inspiring story, um, you know, of someone rising above, you know, circumstances or the current situations that we might think are limiting. And I think it's really a great uh, story for, for us to listen to. And I really hope that this story you know, transcends, you know, throughout the whole of, you know, the globe and uh, most especially in the South African setting where the resources are very limited. And um, I, I really would like to see, you know, interventions that address, you know, the low to middle income, you know, communities, you know, who have, who don't have like, you know, quite good access to, to such, you know, facilities and all that. And I think you, you really have, you know, shared with us a, a great inspiring story. And it's, it, it would be great, you know, for the young people out there who are living with disabilities or the general population to be able to, you know, to hear this and uh, to be inspired and to know that, you know, the sky's the limit and exactly. people can achieve, you know, it's all about your mind. You know, if you set your mind in the right spaces and you, you have, you know, proper support, anything can be done. And you're a true epitome of that, you know, notion of, you know, anything can be done. The right resources with the right mindset and the good support. So thank you very much, Dr. Jeanette, for all that, for that yeah. inspiring story. I don't really have much to say. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Because I have to say, when I actually yeah. started uh, training with sitting volleyball, we used to apply for, you know, various, uh, uh, like access to uh, uh, funding and things like that. And one of the things when they ask you, what do you want to do? What's your goal? My actual goal, all I wanted to do was just to be able to train, just mm -hmm. train with the GB women, 
you know, that was my little goal. Mm. And I've achieved that. Not only have I trained with the GB women, I actually am part of the GB women's team and I have represented them internationally. Mm. So, you know, you, if you focus and have a goal, you can achieve it and excel. Mm. That's exactly what I was going to ask you on now, Dr. Jeanette, is in terms of overcoming challenges, there's such a resilience and persistence that's required to inspire you to reach your end goal. So what was it for you that kept driving you through the process? What energized you in those moments of fatigue where you felt like, you know, I just can't push further? What was the drive? I mean, you have to have it in you, but also faith. You have to have faith and belief, belief in yourself, but also, you know, faith. Set yourself goals and know you can achieve the goals. You know, especially when you're in, uh, you know, very challenging moments. I remember after I was amputated, the doctor said to me, I would never walk again. And I challenged him and I thought, oh God, he must think I'm really like an idiot because he's a you know, high professional person. And I told him I will walk again, you know? Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking to myself, he must be looking at me thinking, God, what's wrong with this lady? Doesn't she know it? And I said, to him, I'm going to walk and I'll walk again. And that day I set myself a goal. I remember sitting there lying down in the bed because I was in a special bed in intensive care and I set myself a goal. And I thought, I'm going to walk. What am I going to do? And I remember visiting Rome and I said to myself, I'm going to walk the length of St. Peter's Cathedral. Because when I visited Rome, I remember how long that cathedral was. And every step, they show you like the length of this church and this church. And I thought, when I get myself up and standing, I'm going to walk the length of St. Peter's uh, Cathedral. And I went there, I walked the length of that cathedral and I met the Pope. So you have to have that drive. You have to have that faith and belief. Mm. You know? And just go. And sometimes you have setbacks and, mm. and sometimes you have to take a deviation, but you will get there. Mm. Mm. Such, such a message. I think it's all in the mind. It's all in the mind. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Sure. And an unwavering focus. Yes. And then just one more question in terms of um, adaptive sports, what sort of physical strength should anyone who'd like to participate in sport, what, sh- what sort of strength should they have or what should they be working on in order to actually achieve what you've done? Well, I mean, various sports are different. I mean, I play uh, the sport. You don't have to be like for sitting volleyball. You don't have to be particularly strong. You mm-hmm. have to be fit. Mm. you know and because also you're on the court being able to slide back and forth Mm. you know and you know you have people that come to play that able-bodied and you know they realize actually need a lot of you know skill and to be very quick Mm. and sometimes they also find that having legs is a hindrance and that's one point where you know if I play against my my uh, my friends that have legs I have an advantage you know Mm. but yeah you just have to be you know you know for fitting volleyball have you know, some level of fitness, but also depends on the level that you're playing. I play international level, obviously you have to be fit. If you're mm. playing as a hobby, you know, that can be just, you know, your normal, your normal fitness and, and you get better the more you play. 100%. Now, thank you so much for that, Dr. Jeanette. Any closing remarks from you, Dr. Lebeko and Dr. Tony? Let me start with Dr. Tony. This is a typical a manifestation of the reality that everything starts with the mind. Mm. You know, I read a lot about the mind, about thinking frameworks, uh, about the, the, the five, the five uh, minds, uh, the, the type of thinking that we engage in. And uh, it, it, you can never go anywhere in the world without, without that. The thought, the mind. I want to do it do it, achieve it. And this is just one of them. I actually also wanted to say that, please, I think let's try to remove the word disabled. Because you are abled. That's true in a different way. I think there should be something else. Mm. I was disabled. You're not disabled here, you are abled. You've done what uh, so-called abled body people could do. I don't know. I think others say differently abled. Yeah, I mean, they say physically impaired. I mean, they're diff- it's just 
come with a consensus. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to yeah, I think we need, we need another uh, session one day internationally to talk about this this term disabled. There are some disabled people who are more able than us. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Thank you, Dr. Tony. Closing remarks from you, Dr. Libeko. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Jeanette, for this inspiring moment. And I think there's a lot for us to take home with. And uh, you truly have inspired you know, a lot of us. And we hope that we're going to put this on various platforms so that we can inspire all the young people that uh, mm -hmm. have got you know, limitations. And I think, as said, you know, your greatest enemy is your mind. And if you work against you know, our greatest enemies, which is our minds, we will achieve a lot. And you've really epitomize that achievement you know through a mindset thank you very much thank you thank you all for your feedback and inviting me to give this talk it has been a pleasure thank you okay Have a good thank you.